Welcome back everyone. As I promised you last time, today we are going to take a look at texturing and shading in Modo. This should be much more interesting than building actual models in Modo for most of you. We won't be doing anything particularly fancy and most of the time we are going to rely on procedural textures for simplicity. I still hope you will find this interesting nonetheless and maybe you can get some ideas how powerful Modo actually is. The great thing about texturing in Modo is that it is mostly an intuitive process. Unlike as in other applications, it is fully integrated into Modo's interface and you can access it anytime. For this purpose, Modo provides a special type of window, which is called the item viewer or the preview window. These windows can be moved around and rearranged just like any other window. Because it is so well integrated into the interface, the item viewer will also allow you to model interactively while the rendered view will update accordingly. This is very different from other programs such as Maya or Lightwave. In those programs the only way to get some interactive rendering is to first render a view and then they will store some temporary buffers that can be tweaked. However, in those programs this does usually not include modeling, so Modo already has a big advantage here. One typical situation where this might come in handy is for instance if you want to adjust some deformations on your model to conform to your template if you are for instance building a model that should be matched with a real world scene. But for the time being let's focus on texturing. As you can see I have loaded our DVD logo again and I also have already added an object that will act as our floor. Unless you have assigned them new materials with different properties, after modeling all objects in Modo share the same material. In our example I have assigned two different materials, one for the logo and one for the floor. I have not given them any special properties yet, so they look like the standard base shader which is some sort of soft grey tone. Let's move ahead and adjust our materials. The first thing that I want to do is add some reflection to the floor. This is a quite common situation, especially if you only have one main object in your scene. Regardless of this, you have reflections everywhere in real life, so it's a quite common need to replicate those in the 3D environment. In most 3D programs this is simply done by increasing the reflection amount or reflectivity amount or whatever it is called. There is no predefined terminology, so every program uses a slightly different description for this. I'm setting the surface to have a reflection amount of about 20%. This is usually enough because most materials usually only have very subtle reflections. You would only want stronger reflections if you were doing a material such as chrome. In nature there are rarely sharp and clear reflections. Therefore I am activating the blurry reflections. This will make the reflections softer the farther away they are from the original object. To stop the objects from becoming too bright the stronger our reflections get, I am also taking down the diffuse amount. The diffuse amount represents the amount of light that is gathered in your scene. The less diffuse amount your object has, the darker it will appear, because it absorbs more light. Now let's add some textures to make our scene more interesting. Our reflection amount looks about right for something like a polished floor. Therefore I'm first adding a checkerboard texture. Initially this texture will be placed along the x-axis. By switching it over to the y-axis we can make it look like tiles. As you can see when it's applied, the texture consists of a black and a white color. However, in our image it already has a bluish tint to it because it reflects the sky, which is of course blue. We want to diminish this effect a little, so I'm changing the black to another color. I'm choosing a light olive green tone. This will match nicely with our backdrop colors, which by the way are Modo's default backdrop colors. You can of course adjust those to your liking. To represent the edges of our tiles, we are applying a grid texture on top of our checkerboard texture. By default, all textures are used for diffuse color. Therefore, our new texture is covering up our old texture. Just as with the checkerboard, we need to change the alignment. So let's switch it again to the y-axis. I want to be able to properly line up my grid with my checkerboard texture, so I either need to switch it to another texture mode or change its opacity. I'm choosing the first method. I want to use my grid texture as a bump map. 
When switching to bump map mode, you will see that it gives the illusion of some depth. You can also see that the sizes do not match. Therefore, let's adjust them. First, let's make our lines much, much thinner. To do so, we simply use lower values in the line width and transition width inputs. We are not concerning ourselves with bias and gain, but just to let you know, those could be used to adjust the sharpness of our lines. Currently our grid always covers four tiles. I would like to adjust it that way so it always covers one tile. I know that my tiles are 20 by 20 centimeters, so I use the same values for the grid. When I change the values, my grid becomes misaligned. This has to do with how Modo calculates the position of the lines. They are always calculated from the center of the texture projection. After I have input the proper values for size and position, our lines will match our grid perfectly. So far we have only dealt with the floor. Now let's move on to the logo itself. This time I'm using the cellular texture. As opposed to simply using this texture for the diffuse color, I want to use it for displacement. Modo uses so-called subpixel displacement. This is a simple way to give your objects a lot of detail without actually creating a lot of geometry. By using textures, you can tell Modo to adaptively subdivide your mesh in certain places and it will create millions and millions of little polygons and render them. Now you may ask, can't I do that with bump maps? Of course you can achieve similar effects with bump maps. However, since they do not create real 3D geometry, they have certain disadvantages. One of those disadvantages is that they do not cast proper shadows in the groves and pits of the object. Another disadvantage is that at the edges you can always see whether a bump map or true displacement was used. Bump maps can only exist within the boundaries of the object itself and are more a way of bending light to give the illusion of depth rather than creating true depth. After playing a little with my settings, I have decided to give my object a different color and change my displacement texture to a dots texture. This will make the logo look like it is made up of separate cylindrical elements or it's covered with some PVC flooring. This still looks somewhat flat, so I decided to add a gradient on top of my displacement texture. The gradient shall be driven by the displacement and I need to adjust it accordingly. Modo provides a great way of dealing with gradients. Unlike in many other apps, gradients are not represented as such. This may at first sight be confusing, but it is also very powerful. By representing gradients with function curves, you get full control over the interpolation, and since you can resize the window to have any size you like, you can adjust them down to the micrometer. By treating each part of the gradient as part of a curve, you get also a great way of controlling interpolation. Gradients can be anything from very linear to downright logarithmic, and Modo gives you the leverage to get just that. If you have ever dealt with animation curves in After Effects, the process would be very similar. Until now, everything looked pretty much like in any other program. While it's a valid assessment, it's not completely true. Therefore, I have turned on the miniature preview in the shader tree. As you can see, this looks pretty much like a Photoshop layer file. To your surprise, you will find out that it also works this way. By turning off the visibility of some layers, they will disappear from our render. This means that Modo does not calculate their effects. This can be very useful if you want to build complex materials. Of course, the fun doesn't stop there. As you would expect, you can also simply rearrange your layers just as you would in Photoshop. When you rearrange the layers, your views will update accordingly as will your miniature previews. This makes it very easy to keep track of your changes and adjustments. It also provides a great way of getting the exact result you are after without making any compromises. In other programs, your options to move your layers around are usually limited. In Modo, these limits do not apply or at least are very loose, so you should not bump into any walls. As you would expect, there is still some logic behind this. Layers that are more towards the top of the shader tree can work on layers below them, but not the other way around. In many situations, this would of course be a limiting 
factor, and if Modo didn't provide any way around this, you'd probably be disappointed. The trick here is to use groups and masks. In Modo's world, groups and masks are basically the same. A group is just a special type of mask. Groups can be created many ways. The simplest way is to assign a material to a polygon. When doing this, Modo will automatically create a group and place the actual material inside this group. Another way to create groups is to use the corresponding function in the shader tree itself. In this case, it becomes more a means of organizing the shader tree itself rather than assigning a new material to your scene. In addition to group masks, you can also use item masks, which basically cover the entire mesh item. And then, of course, you can use any texture as a mask. Let me illustrate this. On our DVD logo, I want to apply another material just to one single polygon. I am selecting a polygon in the lower area of the DVD logo on the circular shape. By assigning it a material with a new name, Modo will automatically place a new item in the shader tree. If you look closely at the mask miniature, you can clearly see that just one polygon in our scene has our material. I'm tweaking a few parameters because I want our material to emit light. I also want it to look like a grid of LEDs. Therefore I'm applying a dots texture again. After some tweaking, I have a result that pretty much looks like what I want. It is still a bit flat though, so I'm going to add another texture to give it some dimensionality. However, this time I don't want to start from scratch and tweak all parameters over and over again. Therefore I'm creating an instance of my dots texture. Just as geometric instances, texture instances are references to an original. This means they will also inherit all changes made to the original. In our example I'm mostly interested in keeping the sizes and the parameters of the dot sizes. I select my dots texture and in the right mouse button menu I select create instance. As you can see instances are indicated by italic text. When I select my instance, I can switch it to affect another aspect of my shading. For our purposes, I will use displacement again. I could still tweak my settings a lot, but I'm calling it a day for the time being. It doesn't look too bad, but it's not perfect, of course. Now that you know the basics of texturing in Modo, I hope you look forward to the next article, where we will discuss how you can transfer your textures to other programs along with your meshes. Until then, Bye-bye.